I've always heard that merchants are the eyes and ears of the customer, and we represent the customer in every single one of the meetings where we're at. I know that if I carry myself with that mindset, this satisfaction, this, this sense of value, uh, when you get something that you really love, is what I aim for, for our customers to have every time that they're in our stores. Today's guest on the podcast is Ramon Marquez. Ramon is the COO and CMO of two longtime brands, Sears and Kmart. Ramon and I had a fascinating conversation. He talked about his rise up the ranks in the world of fashion and design. He talked about what business leaders today can learn from how fashion brands get out in the market and really understand their customers. He also talked about how leaders can use scarcity to foster greater creativity and innovation. And he also shared insights around the rebirth of two longtime brands in Kmart and Sears. Hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Ramon, thanks for coming on today. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for taking the interest to talk to me. So Ramon, you've got a really interesting background. I'd just be curious, as someone who's been in the, the fashion and apparel space for a long time, what was the spark for that? Like, where did you grow up? Like, what was really the impetus to start a career in uh, in fashion and design and apparel? You know, it's interesting. Um, a lot of people ask me how I started in retail, especially people that are trying to get into retail um, coming out of college. And my journey started much earlier. My um, grandfather owned a general store from where my dad is from. And I remember going there on Sundays to visit them and standing behind the register helping customers. And that's probably where it comes from and me wanting to make money out of it um, and guess what they wanted in, in upsell and, and that sort of thing. So fast forward, when I was in college, I took a trip to LA and I bought some sweaters uh, and started selling them uh, to my college friends. And, and that's how I started making some money on the side. Towards the end of my college years, JCPenney was looking for people to open their stores in Mexico. At that time, I'm just going to say how old I am, but um, at that time, the U.S. and Mexico and Canada were signing NAFTA. And, and there was this whole speculation about companies going into Mexico. And I was hired as a merchandise manager trainee, sort of the merchandising program. And Penny's had a great, you know, that's where my retail base started, which I'm really grateful for because Penny's had their buyers at the store. So the, the contact with the customer was right there. So all you had to do was walk out of your office and start talking to your customers. And the idea was that you have the right product at the right time in the right place. Um, unfortunately, that was a very lengthy process and the speak to market was null. And over time, they had to change the way they did it. That's how I got in. And I can tell you that, you know, 30 years later, I definitely followed my passion, what I'm good at. And I just keep, you know, learning and reinventing myself. So yeah, it's interesting is is for me, I broke into into retail and apparel at where we met at, at Old Navy and the old Navy brand under Gap Corporate and out of business school. And I remember how challenging it was to get in. I really just took a, a role that really could fit based on my my background. But clearly you had a knack for design and an eye for fashion if you were buying sweaters at and selling them. It reminds me of a I had the CEO of Blender's Eyewear on the show, one of my very first episodes, and he was actually selling shades out of his backpack at the beach to surfers and people on the beach here in San Diego. And now they're like a you know multi million dollar brand. But like, what did you learn about yourself from those early days of of hawking you know sweaters you know to your friends to you know in Mexico, just like learning about the shoppers? I mean, that's a pretty like head first way of, of diving in versus most people where they're really starting at the bottom. I often think back when I'm trying to make decisions, I think back of my JCPenney years and the tools that we have to be able to make the right decisions. And it, it really formed me going back to, you know, the, the selling sweaters or, or helping my grandfather is that contact with the customer is, is that interaction in, in really understanding what people want. And, you know, today we have all the tools in the world to be able to, to know even more, right? But when you're a merchant and you are really living and breathing what the customers or where the customers are, it's probably the best advantage any, any, any merchant can have. Yeah. Take me a little bit 
further into that because I think retail was probably one of the first to do that. And now it's like you have IDEO with design thinking and this whole idea around empathy and really understanding your customer. So tell me some of the things that that you do as a merchant, whether it was at JCPenney's or Old Navy or at American Eagle, just like, like how do you really get a sense for what the customer wants and needs? Yeah, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough that I've worked for companies that are very customer um, or consumer um, driven. I remember at Gap, by the way, when I got to Old Navy, I was in my late 20s and, and I realized I had spent all these years wearing a tie and, and a suit to go to work. And I come into Old Navy and everybody's wearing jeans and flip flops and, and the fast pace and, and this energy was happening. You know, we had very few stores and I got to be there when, you know, we got to a thousand stores. So, a gap on the very first week, you have to go and work in the store and get to know who the customer was. So in all companies that I work for, the contact with the customer has been extremely important to be able to um, merchandise or, or get to them. That's how branding comes to life and, and how this persona is embodying you. I was fortunate enough that, you know, even though I started in merchandising, then I moved into a planning role. That was my, my way to get into all maybe. Probably about a year, year and a half into the planning role, um, I was given the opportunity to move into merchandising. And that's when I felt that I had gotten to the role where I could succeed. And um, I've always heard that merchants are the eyes and ears of the customer, and we represent the customer in every single one of the meetings where we're at. So I know that if I carry myself with that mindset, um, even until this day, and I think through the customer lenses, I can make better decisions, not only for the company, but for the customer. And I just think about, you know, the time that I walk out of an Apple store with my first iPad or iPod uh, and, and, and I open like that sense of, of satisfaction, right? When, when I remember, I mean, there's so many times I grew up going to malls and, and obviously I like to enjoy shopping. So this satisfaction, this, this sense of value uh, when you get something that you really love is what I aim for, for our customers to have every time that they're in our stores or online. How do you get that, that sense of the customer and how does it impact the design process. Like I know when, when I was in the planning function at, at old Navy and I was in boys denim and woven shirts, which is a, it feels like a lifetime ago, but like, how do you integrate that customer feedback into the design process? We have to carry those eyes, uh, everywhere we go. Right. And try to look for trends. Things have gotten much faster. You know, there used to be a time where we used to go to Europe and like look at color and trends and, and pattern and, and then have these conversations among, you know, our peers about what would the what would the collection look like or, or what does the brand, um, is, what, what is the inspiration for the brand? And right now with technology, things are much faster. You know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm a junkie for pop and for everything that is happening in the world. And I will tell you that in the past was like sitting at an airport, looking at people coming in and out of the planes and looking what they had on to going into the strips where it was all about inspiration and seeing other cities where trends were ahead. But today, all you have to do is open TikTok or, or, or Instagram and, and, and you start seeing trends and things that are happening. Now, if you have now the analytics that we have available, that takes things to a next level. But I do believe, you know, that the closer you are to the customer and the more you live and breathe what they are doing, the closer you, you, you can be to make the, the right decisions. Yeah, especially I just think about like that buying process when you're buying hundreds of thousands of units and if you're disconnected from that consumer, just how badly you can miss. I just remember just the the massive markdowns that we'd be doing on a on a on a week to week basis. Those are the risks we take. So so we have to partner with with the people we work for, and and sometimes you know as merchants we scare everyone around because we get to you know move things ahead, and and someone needs to bring us back to reality. But um, I do believe on that push and pull. I remember walking down Fifth Avenue uh, when I was at American Eagle. And oh my God, if anybody from American Eagle hears this, but I saw a guy wearing this striped shirt and I chased after him and took a picture. I think that there, we barely had um, iPhones then. And I took a picture and came back to the meeting and I said, you know, we need this stripe. This is the stripe. And we did it. And it was the number one tee that we've ever sold. So it became something big, right? So that was a big hit. 
But then there's some misses, right? Then there's some misses of things that, you know, I thought that it was going to happen and, and we have to make the right, the right risks, take the right measurements and mitigate them with better sellers. So, but it's always about moving, you know, moving forward. How do I get better? You know, in retail, we should never sit and think that we arrive. Nothing is forever. And, and, and we got to continuously push ourselves and continue to move the world. You brought up a, a related point in, as you described, working with a suit and tie and then going and wearing more fashion forward clothing. I remember when I was interviewing for the job at Old Navy, I asked a friend of mine who also actually was a merchant previous uh, to me at Old Navy. And he said, dress like you fell out of a Banana Republic store. It made me just realize the importance of living the brand and just like as a way of also getting close to to the customers is actually not just listening and talking to them, but actually living that brand. And I think this applies to not just fashion and apparel and retail, but also even business to business as well. I saw that I also work for Abercrombie and Fitch and Abercrombie has a very strong DNA, a very strong brand. And, and one of the ways for us to understand whether someone was the right candidate or not was to see them in the interview is does this person understand the brand and what we're all about? And you know, the way that they embrace what we had on the floor at that time or the looks that we had was, was a good way to gauge the, the taste level or, or if they understood the brand or not. But even, even when I interviewed, you know, and I was told that I needed to look the part, <laughs> feeling comfortable in my own skin and, and adopting it in a way that it was right for my age at that time and for my body type was important because I felt comfortable and, and I felt good about myself. So um, I think that that transpired on, on me getting hired and, 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 and really enjoying working there as well. Yeah, I think it's also reminds me of just being authentic. And there's different ways that you can live the brand. So with you at a, you know, at, a at an older age and different body type than the, you know, the Abercrombie models at the time, which, you know, that definitely reminds you of some past experiences. But the idea of living out a brand authentically and, and connecting it to a way that really means something to you. So take me forward. You had an interesting arc in terms of working in more mass retail and apparel, as I'll probably miss some, um, I'll butcher what, you know, that that segment and then moving up market, so to speak, from a fashion design perspective, from JCPenney to Old Navy to, and tell me if I'm getting this right, to American Eagle, Abercrombie & Fitch, to New York and Company. Like, what was it like as you you know, ascended and there was an increasing focus on fashion forward and, and from a design perspective. Like what was that like? What did you learn about yourself? I keep saying that I'm really grateful, but I, I am actually really grateful for my career and the places that I work for and for my employers. I work for, for Old Navy, American Eagle, and Abercrombie in my 30s. And, and it was like a 12-year run. And, and these companies were extremely successful. The amount of... Um, the amount of talent at Old Navy while I worked there is, is, is unbelievable. Unbelievable from Jenny down. Then Abercrombie was all about the branding and they were on their, on their biggest, highest earnings years. Um, and then from there, I moved to American Eagle where we got the brand from $2 billion to three. And I think that I'm not sure where they are now today. And I know they're, they're extremely successful, but that was a huge growth. And, and we became the number one market shareholders in all the categories that we were going after. So I believe that every single one of these experiences brought something different to me that made me, you know, who I am today. When I got to New York and Company, it was right after a sabbatical and it was a big awakening. You know, it's, uh, I, will, I have to recognize, you know, after you take time off and you come in and it's so fast paced it took me a little while to to get my hands on on it but what was so great about it was that new york and company was very successful at fast fashion and they had a a speed to market that it was just as good as forever 21. so there was 14 deliveries um, on the floor um, and even though i started in knowledge and that's it, it was a slower then it was still, still much faster than any of the other retailers that I was working for. So that's where you really see things out in the market and you see them in the store within weeks. And to do that, you really have to be fast and precise. And also, um, New York and Company had an incredible amount of talent working there. 
Yeah, your comment about just the, the talent just was reflecting back on the people that were in that old Navy department, just in what they've gone on to do from being the CEO of Victoria's Secrets, et cetera. So the fast fashion question is interesting in that, how did you have to adapt just your style to be successful or as a, as a team, as a company to be able to flow just, just new designs, new products and such a rapid cadence in responding to trends in the marketplace? Like how did that really force you from an innovation and creativity perspective? That's a situation where you have to be full force open to and not being afraid of, of change or, or newness coming in. Because if you are, you know, fast fashion means newness, constant newness and, and adopting new um, trends as they are coming in. Where we come in is not, not everything that is out is something that the brand should absorb. So that's why branding is so important to understand your customer, to understand what your proposition is, because then you can filter of all the things that are out there, which are the things that my customer wants in between you and I and everybody who listens to this and that we can make a lot of money because at the end of the day, my responsibility is with the stakeholders. It is very important that we're not in the fast fashion game because it's a game. It's actually a money game. So we're here to make money. Yeah, that whole idea of of not being afraid, I think, is really interesting. And I can't remember exactly what you said in our previous conversation. There was a question, a pretty profound question that you would ask that really got people to, to challenge the status quo and not just do the same styles quarter over quarter, year over year. Like, you mind just talking about that a bit? Yeah, so that there was uh, Susan McGallit, so uh, a great a great mentor and 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 um, I would say a teacher for me because a lot of the best practices that I still that I have in my arsenal come from Susan. There was a point in time where things got stale and and we needed to push the brand forward. So she would start the meetings every single meeting we needed to recite. You know how are we different from last year? And that's just what I was alluding at earlier is that how do we push ourselves to continuously evolve, to continuously to push forward? If you went to the mall, if you log into the website and you see the same things that you saw, you know, 12 months ago, we're going to lose your attention. You're going to go somewhere else. So at the same time, these companies are, um, the sheer volume that they make is so big that they also cannot drop everything they've done and gone into something else and put the company at a risk, right? So it's about evolving. It's not about just dropping and moving on to something else. Yeah, I'd love just to switch gears a little bit and talk just about some of the leadership lessons you've learned about yourself. And it's it's interesting is when we had met before, you know, many, many years ago, you know, Ramon's this like designer, fashion, pop star almost, you know, within the old Navy world. And then we reconnect years later and you're talking about him, you know, humility and empathy and listening and a lot of these soft skills, because those are obviously such important mindsets and skills for leaders to learn. Tell me about like, how you learned to be like that and that new, that new version of yourself. If we get to be here for a long time, like you and I have, we get older, right? And, and, and we put a lot of years in and, and we become adults. And, and I think that um, I was fortunate enough to go through a process that um, helped me arrive to, to a place where I can call myself an adult. There was a point in time where I had to do, um, take a sabbatical and take time off from work. Um, and as a result of that, I'm in recovery. I'm sober. And that process was something that was extremely pivotal on who I am today um, because it, it really I don't want to say it changed me, it transformed me. It, it, um, it helped me leave some things in the past that I had to solve and, and, and allow me to get a grip on how the rest of my life was going to be like. So when you go through a process like that, it is very humbling. And it's, um, you know, you go from one day being the rock star at the job where you are. And overnight, you don't have a job. You're unemployed. And I've heard unemployable. And it's very humbling. So how does that affect me today is that there's more empathy. I think that, you know, today I work for Sears and Kmart and I'm very proud of that. And a lot of people um, have questioned why or they can't believe that I'm there or that I'm still there. But for me, I've, I've reframed this in a way that 
just like my experience was not a downfall, it was actually an opportunity for me to grow. I've reframed this experience, which has been extremely rich into, instead of thinking that I'm the one unwinding the company or I'm the last man standing, I'm actually the founding team of a startup. And, and, and I get to uh, work with a team that is energized by, by what we can do, not what we've been. Um, and that's kind of like where my life was. I, I think that my experience at work in going through all these great companies prepare me just as much as the personal experiences of becoming an adult because of that grip, because of that empathy for others. You know, I am, um, unfortunately, you know, we downsize the team so much and, and we're a much smaller company than we ever were. And having those hard conversations with people and having the tough conversations, like only when you lost a job or only when, 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 you've gotten let go or you've had to stop, you understand what that's like. And, and when you deliver messages and there's downsizing or there's layoffs, you understand what the other people, the other person is going through and, and you can actually make that journey much smoother and help them out get through it. So when, when Sears and Kmart filed bankruptcy, I had just started in the company and I was really nervous. I had just moved with my partner to San Francisco and I didn't know if we were going to like get through it. If we were going to get laid off. What was going to happen? And, um, I was working with a coach and I wanted the coach to tell me if I needed to pack and run or if I, if I should stay. Right. Um, I was under a contract. So <laughs> the idea of running was probably not the smart one. And, and what that coach, um, helped me see was that actually it was my personal experience that made me the best candidate to be able to help the team get through this new startup and being able to lead them into what we're working today. So it has actually been a pretty good match and uh, so far so good. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, whether it's an analogy or a metaphor, I always screw that one up, but just, it's like your career was reborn, you know, after going through you know, the trials and tribulations that you had. And now it's like these two brands are being re reborn, especially Sears was like the place, you know, I remember buying appliances, I would always go to Sears, you know, before like, you know, Home Depot is what it is and, and so forth. But what a amazing opportunity to get to, to give like the rebirth of these two brands that have been around for so long. Yeah. And, and not everything's gone, you know, not, you know, we don't have to throw away everything that the company was ever, you know, just like my personal life, I need to lean on the things I'm good at. I need to lean on my strengths, you know, and I need to uh, course correct the things that I need to work on. There's an incredible amount of talent. And, you know, I had a um, like aha moment recently where I realized, you know, some of the people on my team have been around for 34 years and, and they got to work for the best retailer of America all the time. I mean, because what Sears meant to the world in their big years was much bigger than I mean, with all due respect to Amazon, than Amazon today, because Amazon still shares market share with everybody else. Sears was it, right? So you think about the people on the farms or the or the suburbs or, or whatever it is, when they got that catalog, it was everything, you know? So some of the people on my team worked for well, at the time where this was it. So talk about humility. Like talk about someone who has, you know, put themselves now and they're still passionate about, you know, making this work or as helping, you know, like the way I frame it, restart. It takes a lot of leadership to be able to lead a team with such a shift in gears and to keep everyone energized and focus on the things that, you know, you're focused on. Yeah, it's an interesting balance, you know, looking at what, what you said, which is it's it's what we can do, not necessarily where you've been at the same time honoring where we've been in our experiences, whether that's a brand and a company or it's us as our leader, you're not, you know, I didn't mean to say you're like a fundamentally different person. It's just like this extra dimension to you. You're still like, you know, that pop star to me in terms of like the designer, but now you've got this additional layer of depth around empathy and humility, which is really cool. You know, and, and, and you know, another and thing that is important to, to, to understand is that, you know, we, we have, um, very successful high performance stores in remote places like Guam or the Virgin Islands or in Puerto Rico. And to those customers, 
when they come into the stores, they don't hold Sears or Kmart accountable for bankruptcy or for new missteps or for anything. To them, it's a store of choice because that's the store they have in that island, right? So my responsibility is to deliver the promise to them and act as if I didn't have all these issues going on on this side of the house. So it, it's about being customer centric, you know, and now you're talking about putting all these obstacles and, and, and issues in front of you. But to them, that's what it is. I mean, I can tell you, there's also like all these fun stories. Um, but I've arrived in the Virgin Islands and the TSA person pulled me aside when they asked me where I work. And I said, well, I'm here for Kmart and pulled me aside. He's like, you're not here to close the store, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, no, no. I said, I'm here to actually, we're working on revamping the store. We're doing these things. And he was really energized. Well, I was in Guam two weeks ago and the same thing happened with the border patrol person where like they asked me where I work. And I said, you know, we're for Kmart. He's like, you're not here to close the store. So it's like, it makes me realize, you know, to them, this is it. So if I don't deliver like this is it, then I'm failing and I'm not here to fail. Yeah. One of the things that we talked about in a past conversation is really is part of my book project is how do I get my team to be more creative? And you talked about something that's really interesting in terms of using scarcity as really like as a tool or a lever to really just maximize your level of creativity and innovation. Do you mind just like sharing a little bit about some of that backstory and the things that you do to really foster that sense of creativity? So I'm going to take you outside retail and I'm going to give you an analogy on how this, how I think about this. So I'm a student now. I went back, I'm doing my MBA and I'm really passionate about it. We can use another hour just to talk about that experience. But so there's really nothing. I mean, I became a student I'm a, while I'm working at night. But on my daily life, like my pantry is a student's pantry, right? So there's no food in there. So talk about scarcity and creativity. Like for me to figure out what to eat when I finish at night and like what, what type of sandwich. I mean, I'm creative and I'll come up with the most craziest combinations. And I think that that's what, that's, that's what I was talking about. You know, in my current job there's a lot of scarcity we don't have the funds that we once had we i don't have the trips to europe to get inspired or i don't have um all the technology that i wish i had i come up with it um as as much as i can but i also don't have you know hundreds of people trying to figure out things for me so that has put us in a position where we hustle and we, we figure things out and, and, and actually makes me think outside the box. And it's like, if I can merchandise a store this way, can I partner with another company and have them come over? And then I do some sort of, you know, creative financial deal where we both benefit from my real estate and my customer um, base. So. It's uh, creativity has come in a, in a very different way under this role. So I believe scarcity brings creativity for sure. As a leader, perhaps you're not in a situation. I mean, although, you know, economy is in this weird situation right now, whether we're going into recession or where we are, but just in general, how can a manager use the idea of scarcity to really foster innovation and creativity? When you put all the tools out there, people may not be as engaged. But would you um, push a team and, and maybe not put all the tools out there? Y you can get some, some good feedback, some good sparks, some, some conversations. I think that, you know, um, for innovation, for creativity to come in, you also need to set up the right atmosphere and the right tone uh, for people to not be afraid to bring those things. Because I work for people, like every time I open my mouth, like they will get scared and like they will like raise their voice, right? And that really actually limit me on, on things that I could have thought. Here, where I am at, we're trying to figure it out. So if we don't speak and if I don't encourage people to speak up, then we're not going to move any further. So I think that we, we need that innovation. Another thing that always works for me is just continuously asking questions. You know, my, 
I'm the type of person, my head never stops. So I'm always thinking through it, you know, off work, on work, like in the job, out at night, uh, during the weekends, I'm texting people pictures of things I see or, you know, random messages. Sometimes I watch myself about what times I'm texting my team. Well, not sometimes, all the time. Uh, and I try to be respectful over the time, but I'm always making notes and I'm always asking questions. And I was talking to someone at uh, the head of stores this morning and he was telling me, he was, when you come into the store, you always see things that, you know, in a different way. And I say, and it's because we got to constantly keep challenging ourselves to think and ask questions, ask questions. And I think that that's a good way to get the team to start thinking different. When you, when you have curiosity, the possibilities are limitless. Yeah, it's interesting is something you talked about before is just this sense of humility and empathy and also curiosity is that just the challenge as a leader when you have the answer, essentially, right? You have an idea for the designs for this next season for what to do from a merchandising perspective. But what you're talking about is almost taking a back seat and creating space for people. And that requires a huge sense of, of humility, frankly, but also empathy to say, look, like, I want to hear about them. I'll put myself in their shoes so they can actually learn more and bring more input into the room and make better decisions, frankly. Yeah. And, and, you know, and there's two things that I want to add to that. One, there's also the time when you have to make the decision and call it. And you got to, you know, you can't have the team just spinning and spinning and spinning when you have the answer. So there's a point in time that you have to, I mean, that's why you are the lead. And that's why you're, you're managing a project, right? So you got to make that decision and, 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 and move forward. Yeah, I'd love to hit that point in terms of there, of course, is a time when you got to make a decision. You, we don't want a, a culture of consensus because that's where ideas get watered down. How do you keep the team bought in when you do create space for everyone's perspectives and opinions, but make the decision? How do you get people to feel like their ideas were heard and respected and be bought into whatever the decision that was made? Well, first of all, you know, you have to, you know, if I make the decision, I own it. We walk away and we agree on, and I'm the person signing off on, on the decision. I own it and I own it all the way through. So, so people need to feel, you know, that, you know, the responsibility is not only on them. And the other thing is that we have to celebrate people for the ideas that they bring in and, and, and constantly remember, I don't forget things. I, I can tell you, I, I go to a lot to the stores and, and, and I don't forget things the team have done and I recognize it all the time. And, and I think that they, they, they people re appreciate that. You know, I remember when I was 23 years old and the CEO of JCPenney came into my store and the comments he made about some bears that we put up on a wall. He took, like, he was all excited about it. And he's like, I, I mean, I came home and I called my dad and I told him like that I was just doing such a good job. And you know, the bright was, the future was bright and all this. So I know the weight of our words when we are working with the teams. And that's, you know, that's something that I learned now. Like I probably didn't know for the first 15, 20 years. But it's something that I know now that is our words come with a lot of weight. Yeah, it's so true, like the weight of the words. But something you you didn't say, but I know you you do, is that when a decision is made, if it was someone else's idea, it's not successful, you fall on the sword. And when things do go well, regardless of who it was, you're celebrating them, which is just such a great, just a great way to lead. What good does it do to me now? to hammer my team on, I'm the smart, like, you know, to, to drive that I am the smartest person in the room. What good does it do to me? There's a uh, new show I watch tonight and, and the, the commentator always, um, the, the host always says, you know, let's get smarter when she's going to talk to the team of people that she has in the panel. She just says, you know, let's get smarter. I think that that's the attitude that we should have when we go into meetings, when we are leading people. Like, I want to get smarter. Like, let's, let's all get smarter. Let's all talk. Let's, let's all put things on the table. And, and, and it won't be a waste of time. But the leader as well, and that, that's where the humility comes in, is, is even if you have the expertise, the 20, 30 years of experience, that person who comes in, maybe it's not the right answer, but it, it is a perspective that's still valid. And actually creating space for that is a really this powerful way of for leaders to create connection and also to, to get great ideas out there. I mean, but Darren, who is moving the world right now? Gen Z. They are the ones moving the masses. 
you have Severina Carpenter that overnight is like, boom, she had three songs on the top five on the first week. So things are happening much faster. Things are getting to much, many more people like at the speed that we've never done. So my 30, 40 years go out the window when you have someone with, you know, very little experience that comes in and makes such a big impact. So things are different, you know, that's why I went back to school. I mean, there, there's, there's a thing about, you know, Gen Z's are much more educated when they come into the workforce. And then baby boomers are retirement. I'm not a baby boomer, just so you know, I'm a Gen X. So I, uh, baby boomers are retiring much older. So what you have is a working population that is the younger people are much more educated and the older people are much more experienced. So when you have that combination and I saw myself in the middle, I said, well, either, you know, that I'm experienced, I am because I'm, I'm old, but what I need is to go back and get the education, you know, to be able to actualize myself and be able to, to lead this generation. It's right there, you know, and a lot of humility needs to come in from us at this point in time to understand that they're coming in and they're coming in very strong. And maybe we were the same way when we were at that age and, and, and older generations saw us coming in, you know, but technology has changed it all. So just curious, like where are things with Kmart and with Sears? You know, I know the brand went away. I remember when the last store closed here in San Diego. Where does it stand? And like, what does the future hold for both of those brands? Well, Darren, if I knew, <laughs> if I knew, that was a question of the million dollars, right? Um, I will tell you, you know, just for today, we're running a very small fleet of stores and we are working very hard to um, be able to help the customers where we are and continue to be their store of choice. Uh, where we're heading to, we, we're doing a lot of testing. Uh, we've done testing. We reopened a store in California. Um, we learned from that. So it's just like a startup. You know, I can't tell you today that we will ever have 7,000 stores. I don't think any retailer can do that at that level right now. And, and the growth is in e-commerce. So we're working on it. Ramon, I appreciate your time. It was super fun catching up and hearing more of your story. But uh, thanks for coming on today. Appreciate it. Well, absolutely. I hope that I was able to um, to help and uh, congratulations on all the work that you're doing. It's, it's very impressive. Thank you so much for inviting me.